So, I um, want to start with a saying that I'm sure we've all heard of, it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? right? This is something that we hear all the time, and maybe we hear it so much that we can become quite complacent and flippant about it. And so I want to put some real meaning behind that. And those of you that have heard me speak before would have seen some of these stats, but they're powerful yeah. stats, so they're worth repeating. 84% of B2B decision makers start the buying process with a referral. That's absolutely huge. And the thing is, it's not just the stats that back it up. This stuff is tribal. Kind of word of mouth marketing is the oldest form of marketing. It speaks to our innate kind of tribal connectivity and belonging. And yet it's the area of marketing that I think most businesses least amount of time or strategy behind. Um, quick show of hands. How many of you guys get referrals into your business right now? Okay, most of you, just a slight lag on the hand putting up. That's what I thought. How many of you would have said that you kind of had a proper process behind this? Okay, yeah, we've got, we've got a couple. And how many of you have said you've got kind of reliable partners who refer you consistently? Okay, brilliant. We've got, okay, nice. I like that. So we've got partners, one up process. We can certainly work with that. And you know what? Those stats back out because despite it being this, powerful form of marketing only 30 percent of brands said they had a formalized program but one of something i do want to add here is that the word formalized kind of can make kind of people shudder sometimes um i like the word intentional because what today isn't going to be about is affiliate marketing which is a perfectly justified way of doing things but everything that i do is based on how you leverage real genuine personal interaction and relationships and really trusted relationships so it's just about doing this stuff with intent rather than your strategy being an organic one which essentially is leaving it to chance um because here's the real kicker and here's the biggest stat that i just kind of want to leave there a little bit um 86 more revenue growth so i want you just to take the time to imagine what business would be like if you experience 86 percent more growth than 70% of other business owners out there, right? That'd be quite nice, I imagine, right? And that happens with kind of partnership and referral marketing. The great thing is, is that when you're intentional about it, you grow your business with the right clients, sales cycles are shorter, there isn't ghosting, they're less likely to haggle on price, and you're in this lovely position where, where actually the lead gen part of your business can actually be a really enjoyable thing rather than many people the bit that makes it feel a bit icky so very quickly for those of you that i haven't had the pleasure of meeting before a very quick bit about me um i used to run a membership organization i used to work for the chamber of commerce i then run a, ran a membership organization business scene which you can see in the top logo there we grew that membership organization to almost two thousand members it was entirely through um well, through word of mouth um some of our benefit partners were some of the big global brands you see there um, and I then the membership organization morphed into a benefit business where we were, I was responsible for providing leads to these big global brands. And I provided tens of thousands of leads um, over a four or five year period. And we were a crucial part of the engagement strategy. Now at Collaboration Junkie, I help brands just like you identify, nurture and scale referral and partnership opportunities, all based on real lived experience. So either growing my business through referrals or having to give referrals to some of those brands you see there and all the things that they did wrong and that stopped me giving them leads. I've now flipped that on its head. And that's what I want to share with you today. Um, I've mentioned referrals and partnerships a couple of times. So just very quickly, I class referrals as the things you can get from your customers, your clients, your wider network, anyone and everyone. Partnerships, which is what we're covering today, slightly more strategic relationships. They're typically working with other organizations who share a same end goal as you for the client. And we'll come on to that, um, which means they're, they have a vested interest in, in introducing you on a consistent basis. And so that's the area that we're going to cover today. If referrals is, uh, if you want to do referrals, then next month's workshop will be on that. Right. They're called strategic partnerships, which means you need a strategy um, and dance is my strategy. Um, so what we're going to cover today, these are the five steps that were promised in the title of the event. 
We're going to look at discovery, who your ideal partners are. We're going to look at assembly, the systems and the structure that, that kind of make up your partner programme. We're going to look at how you nurture the relationships. At the end of the day, partnerships are fundamentally about relationships. We're then going to look at how you help your partners connect you to their audience, how you actually get the partnerships delivering leads. And last but not least, we'll be looking at engagement. How do you go out there and engage with strategic partners and, and bring them in? And for a lot of people, they think that's the, the key bit. Um, but there's a reason why it's at the end of my framework, uh, not just because it was it's an E. Um, if you do the other four bits right, that piece at the end is actually the easiest bit. And these other four bits are by far the most important. Um, one golden rule, make it easy. So quick show of hands, who's busy at the moment? Yeah, yeah, everyone, right? Life is busy. Like we, we're in this busy hustle culture environment, which means we become um, a kind of lazy and not slobbing about lazy, lazy in a sense of if something isn't easy for if something isn't part of our core activity, if it isn't easy for us to do, even if we want to do it, we'll put it on the I'll get round to it pile. And I don't know about you, but my I get round to it pile only I only ever get round to it when I kind of sweep it off the metaphorical desk and start another one often. So if you want something to do, if you want someone to do something for you, which essentially people giving you introductions is, you want to make it as easy as possible for them to do that. And so that's the golden rule that kind of sits up right on top of everything else. So we start off with discovery, um, who your ideal partners are. And this is such a crucial step. And um, when I work with clients, it's one fifth of the framework, but it's a third of the work we do together. Because once you've got this bit right, it drives all of your other decision making. And much like if you have ideal clients, it doesn't mean that you don't partner with other people. But having a really clear vision of who your ideal partners are means that you're much more likely to attract them and you can gear everything else you do around delivering to them. And um, the first rule of this is to be specific. First of all, you want to be specific about what type of partners you're looking for. There can be a tendency sometimes to lump everyone that you know and that, that you pass a role to or give a role to you as a partner. But I would argue that there's pretend there's well, there's a at, at a bare minimum in terms of lead gen, there's typically two types of partners. There's either referral partners who are more likely to be able to refer you, and you might pass them the odd referral, and then you have service partners. These are people who help you do your work and you're much more likely to be able to pass them leads. And it's really important to understand where people sit in that chain, because if you're expecting a service partner to be giving you as many leads as you're giving them, it's not gonna work. It's why I think cost referral relationships that often fall down. So first of all, be really clear around why you're looking to partner. You then want to be really specific about who your, who your target market is. Look, this isn't a niching workshop, but the more specific you are about the people you really want to work with, be that sector, be it that size, be it stage of business or individual, whatever it may be, the easier it is for you to figure out who an ideal partner is. So even if you're not going to rebrand and become a specialist in dealing with crocodile dentists from Ipswich, um, just think about the segment of your customer base that you love working with and think about that as a strategy, partnerships as a strategy to grow that particular chunk. Because once you've got that really specific person, um, business type and then role within the business is also a key one. There's a really simple um, three step strategy that I'm going to very quickly go over to at least get a partner shortlist up together. And some of this stuff may seem obvious, but Believe me, it's not always. And uh, this is an exercise I would encourage you to go and do, but I typically would go on a walk or do something like that. Get away from your desk, go and be creative about it. First thing you need to do, and this is a long list, is think of everyone, everything else that that person who you, that, that, that you've identified as, a, as your ideal client, think of all the other things that they're buying, right? Who else are they engaging with? Be that products, be it services, be it 
communities, think of all the other stuff that they are that they're, they're responsible for. Right, it'll be a big long list when you get when you get going. Go back through that list and look at alignment. And what I mean by this is, are they talking? Is the is the are the people on this list? Are the things they're talking about to your target market congruent with what you're doing? Because yes, they may be responsible for purchasing the stationery within their business. But if you're a financial advisor, then that's not necessarily the the, the right alignment of of conversation, right? So go back through, figure out who who are going to be having the most relevant conversations. Um, and then think about authority. Does the person within that business, if they try and introduce you, is that actually going to carry enough weight? Because maybe there's an alignment in terms of what the business does and um, the type of service. But if that other person's a sales rep and actually you need, you're need something that's at a higher level, then maybe there's a little bit of a mismatch there. Once you've gone through that process, I would encourage you to have no more than five ideal partner types. And from there, you can look at what I call a partner value proposition. Um, and your partner value proposition is all the reasons why a partner would want to work with you. Um, it's not look, talking about why you want to work with their clients. It's about making it about them. And this is the crucial step that so many people fall down on. Um, and it's that piece around as, that I said in terms of um, at the start, in terms of understanding where someone sits as a service or a referrer. Your ideal partners typically come just before you in the value chain of a customer. If you have a customer here with a problem and the solution is over here and there's five businesses that offer a service to get to that end point, who sits just before you or overlaps you? I'm going to use I'll use I'm going to use a copywriter as an example because I can see Jen in the corner of my eye. Um, so for Jen, let's a great partner for Jen could be website developers, right? Because as a customer, I go to a website developer. I'm not going for a well-built website. Ultimately, I'm going for the whatever result I want delivered from that website, right? So for Jen, she's approaching if she's approaching website developers to be partners, then her value proposition isn't introduce me to your client because I can write great copy for them. It's we should work together because I can help you develop a, um, deliver websites to your customers that deliver the end result they're looking for. A real subtle shift, but it makes a world apart because one is saying, I want to sell to your list. The other is saying, I understand the journey that we're both on to deliver for our customer and let's work together to deliver that. And that partner value proposition piece, I honestly cannot stress enough that if you get that right, it unlocks so many doors. Cool. Are we all okay with that concept? Yeah? Awesome. Right. So moving on. We know who we're partnering with and we know why we hold value to um why we hold value to them. Next is the systems and the structure. This stuff isn't going to win you partnerships necessarily, but it is going to keep them. It's the thing that's going to mean you get long lasting relationships, which is what you want. And there's a reason why I use a festival scene, not just because I love festivals, but I want you to imagine the best ever lineup at a festival. It's a new festival and whatever music you're into, whether it's obscure punk bands like Seb or, uh, or whatever it may be, all killer, no filler. You are super excited to go. This is going to be amazing. Someone's reformed. We're never going to reform. Um, but you get there. <clears throat> takes hours to get in because the ticketing's a shambles. Once you get in there, there's only one bar and they're serving crap beer and it's warm. Then the band start and they're all out of sync. So the lineup's not right and the sound system is terrible. So you leave at the end of the day. Lineup comes around for year two. Absolutely amazing again. Probably not buying a ticket because you've lost all trust in them to actually deliver the experience that you were looking to deliver and that's why it's so important to yes do that front of house fluffy wonderful marketing bit but make sure you've got the right systems and structure in between because what we need to do is we need to build trust and we need to we also need to set ourselves up for scale 
two of the things here that I want to cover. Um, first of all, it is around tracking, tracking of data. Every time someone makes an introduction to you, they are not just giving you a lead. They are entrusting you with a little bit of their reputation. And that is the most kind of crucial thing any of us have. And so we need to make sure that we treat that with the respect that it deserves, which means we need to be able to know where people are in our prospect journey and then our customer journey so that if a partner wants to know, we're able to tell them very quickly, all oh, right, yeah, this is what's happening here. It may seem obvious, but believe me, it isn't. I've had partners before that weren't able to do that. And it said one of two things to me, either they had mislogged it because they didn't want to pay commission at the other end, which means they were being a crook, or they genuinely didn't know, which means they were being incompetent. And crook and incompetent are not good looks if you want to build long lasting, trusting relationships. So track data. Look, you can spend thousands a month on fancy partnership management software. You can spend tens of pounds a month on a CRM system. It's better to have a spreadsheet that you use than a CRM system that you don't. Whatever you do, whatever your systems track. The other thing I want to mention is around lead handling. Um, one of those big global brands you saw um, on that on that kind of about me slide, um, we entered into a new partnership with them when around my membership organization and both our, our members were going to get something like 200 free bits of sales data, high quality sales data. And our non members were going to get 100 bits and we're like, we use it as an attraction tool. We thought, awesome. We set up our systems really nicely. We sent an email out and all people had to do was click the button to say, yes, I want my leads. And in a completely GDPR compliant way, it sent their details to said benefit provider to contact them, told them how successful it was going to be. They said, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, we'll, we'll handle that. Two day turnaround on callbacks. So that's what we promised on the email. We sent the email out. We delivered, I think it was something like 489 leads over a two day period, which meant it took them two weeks to respond to everyone. So instead of happy members and happy prospects phoning us up to join membership, we had the exact opposite. Now that's not the norm that partnerships kick off that successfully and I'll come on to that at a future point, but you do want to make sure that you're set up to be able to cope with the influx of leads and that you, that you handle them in a, in a professional, timely manner, because again, you're just going to erode trust. Otherwise that partnership never recovered because of it, because of that kind of initial piece. So it's kind of, it's kind of almost expect the worst, but it's set up, set up for best expectations and then you can't go wrong. The other piece I want to cover on structure is reward and recognition. So referrals, really gray area. Putting commissions behind things can actually make people very icky and turn people off. Partnerships slightly different. So as a rule, I'm a fan of there being some kind of commercial relationship in a partnership. I think it elevates the relationship from a friendly handshake to something more meaningful. I also think it helps protect against people, uh, different people in businesses coming and going. It just adds some formality there. Not all sectors can, can receive commissions, and we'll come on to that, and it should never be the main reason why someone introduces you. Part of the value proposition should, should make up 90% of the decision. This should be a small piece that helps just solidify the relationship. Um, depending on your product or service, depends on whether you do one off fee or ongoing. If you've got an ongoing subscription based kind of retainer service, then I would recommend you doing an ongoing referral, uh, an ongoing commission on that. I'm a big time. I'm a big fan of lifetime value of a customer. So paying someone ongoing, be it 10% or whatever it may be. Um, I know people that do sliding scales so it drops as 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 years go on and i also um, know people that do things that while you're an active referrer so as long as people are actively still introducing then they get their commissions and then if they haven't after like a year then it then it trails off there is the only right or wrong here on this piece is that it has to feel fair and equitable to both parties Right. If your if your commission is so low that it's almost insulting, then it's not going to inspire your partners. It's going to annoy them. But equally, you need to run a profitable business. Jules, yes. And um, how would you do that when you're managing your like uh, prices? Um, for me, I've got my price that I pay my team, and then a profit margin, and then a sundries like normal business margins. Would you just add a further column? 
for an introducer fee that's a percentage sliding scale or how would you do it yeah it's 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 you want to make sure there's enough room in your margins to be able to cover it's a cost of sale essentially because you've not had to do any there isn't a marketing spend to do that there is, yes there's your time in setting up these partnerships but you're not doing other marketing and sales based activity to attract these people in it's a it's a kind of a cost of sale piece so yeah i would just factor that in as another piece in terms of that um it, it's always nicer when the, the commercial piece is as simple as it possibly can be um, but I've worked with people before where it's a percentage of a profit, things like when we had insurance benefits and there were brokers, it wasn't obviously off policy, it was off their, off, off their piece. So you can dice it up slightly differently, Jules, but, um, but yeah, I will, what I'll do is when I send a follow up email as well, I'll share a link to a 25 minute video thing that just on all the different things around pricing, because we could talk all day on this stuff. The main thing is it needs to be fair and equitable. If you've got people that don't want to accept commissions a really nice thing you can do is still keep that chunk to one side but put it into a charity and if it can relate either to what your business does or what their business does or both if they're aligned even better because it just adds another really nice angle and another marketing angle but it, there's still that that formality piece there um, i've seen people do that very very well before thank you no worries right so we've got our systems and our structure um Next, we come on to the nurturing. This is the fun bit of the partnerships, right? This is building relationships. This is the tribal piece of our connectivity and, and enjoying what we do. But it's also where we uncover the most amount of opportunity. Um, so there are different reasons to be communicating with our partners. Some are functional. So this could be proactively keeping people up to date with what's going on with the leads that they've sent in, right? Some around building a relationship which means there's different styles of comms we use. Particularly in the, in the software space, there can be a real tendency to over-automate partnership delivery. Oh, we don't need to speak to our partners. Like they can get access to everything they need from our wonderful portal. Wonderful, brilliant that they've got that. But how are you building a relationship? How are you uncovering extra kind of opportunities? Um, there is absolutely a place for AI-driven or templated communications. And typically it's around what's going on in the partnership day to day, monthly reports on the kind of the tracking, all that type of stuff. But do not, please, 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 at your peril, kind of forget that there's a human relationship to develop at the absolute core of this. And so there's three main communication points out of a whole load of others, like onboarding and everything else. But there's three main things that I see people not do that, I'm gonna, that I want to cover today. First one, setting expectations. This is the number one reason why I've seen partnerships fail, fizzle out, even end very acrimoniously, is expectations haven't been set at the start. And there's two, the two most powerful expectations you can set. This is before you agree a partnership. It can feel really counterintuitive when you're taking over the world and it's all going to be exciting to go, let's come back and focus. First one is long term, because if you and your chosen partner or partners are only 5% out in your thinking, that might not be apparent in the midst of your early discussions, unless you really talk about it. But I'm going to do a little drawing to, rep to represent this. Da, 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 da. If you're 5% out at the start, then over time, over time that bit develops and you're 50% out and suddenly you feel all kind of out of kilter, right? So check in literally talk about there's a lovely question that i like which is what does long-term success look like what does wild long-term success look like for you and they might go oh actually alex we're looking to build that kind of that whole piece actually into our agency within the next uh, within the next few years now that doesn't mean you don't partner with said agency alex right but it's better for you to know in advance that they're going to be bringing that in-house maybe you you or how you support them and, and, and let them do that but really getting long-term objectives clear, absolutely crucial. And at the other end, short-term. So many partnerships, and typically partnerships that have the biggest scope, never get off the starting block because you spend so long planning world domination that you never get going. And then someone gets pulled in a different direction, priorities change, 
this has happened to me um, lots because we were dealing with much bigger organizations and we didn't act quick enough and something changed right and they never got off the ground so what is the simple thing you can do right now just to get going right even if it's sharing some content what's the simple thing you can do to get going and who's doing what when to make that happen because momentum is a very powerful thing in life but especially in partnerships and once you get going not only um if it's going to be a successful partnership it gets you going but it's also a great way to actually see what people are like to work with before you've gone all in are they actually going to do what they what they say they're going to do um so really important to set expectations i would document them it's up to you whether you want to do that as a formal partnership agreement or whether you just want to do a email going hey lucy great to talk so excited about the opportunity look this is what i think we agreed bam 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 can you drop me an email back just to confirm right that's a partnership agreement right um some people i've had in my time i've signed huge great big long ones i barely read that for me isn't what a partnership agreement is about you might need some of that stuff for me the agreement's about how we're actually going to work together and what we're aiming to do so set expectations the next one's keep your partners informed so that's that tracking piece right uh yes if people can get access to live information wonderful but um proactively sending people a monthly report or whatever it may be keep let them know what's going on with their reputation share successes and if something's going wrong with a client you definitely want to keep people informed right like like let them hear it from you before they do the the shared the shared client or the lead um and the final one is have strategic reviews because on the other end of the spectrum of we don't need to talk to our partners, they can get all the information they want, is the, oh, we speak to our partners every day, all the time. That's typically about stuff that's happening in the partnership, day-to-day -day stuff. There's a, the wonderful thing about having strategic reviews is that um, A, you can build a relationship. If you're able to do it over lunch or whatever it may be, then do it. But A, you're able to build a, a personal relationship. But from there, you can celebrate wins and things like that. If things aren't going quite as they should, and you know that because you've set your expectations up, so there's no awkward conversations, it's a very factual one, we're able to do that in a relaxed environment. You're also asked, asked, able to ask your partners if there's anything you could be doing better. The sorts of things that they wouldn't necessarily pick up the phone to you about or drop you an email about, but do niggle them, put them in a more relaxed environment, and they go, actually, you know what, Lee, there is this one thing when this report comes through, or when this happens, it'd be nice if you could do this. Because the smoother you make it for your partners, the longer they'll, the longer they'll stick around. Um, the other really powerful thing that you can do is be curious. Just ask them what's going on in their world. How many times have you been with a client or a partner, or even someone in your network that you know knows you, and they go, oh, we're just doing this with this person. And you go, oh, we do that. Then you know that we do, and you know they know that because you've mentioned it to them before, right? But unfortunately, we are not top of mind for all of our for all of the people that we would like to be all the time. And so, by having strategic reviews and being genuinely curious about what's going on, we will uncover more opportunity for ourselves and more opportunity for other people. Curiosity is the birthplace of opportunity, and so give yourself the kind of scope to be able to be curious and do that piece. And honestly, the partnership should be more enjoyable and much more impactful and more profitable as well. Okay, so we know who we're partnering with and why. We've got our system set up. We've got the communication processes in place to build relationships. So now the piece that ties it all together is how do we actually get partnerships working? Because again, I'm sure you've all been part of relationships that should have been amazing and, and don't, right? They just don't deliver. And this really comes into the making it easy for people, right? You're great at selling what you do because you know it. Your partners don't necessarily. And so there are two aspects to this. The first one is about partner facing materials. This is especially relevant where you're working in partnership with someone who has a team of people because you and the owner may get on wonderfully 
they're opportunistic, just like you. They see it all. But if it's a if it's a team that's delivering this stuff day to day, there's going to be actually kind of activating the partnership. Well, then you need to be getting in front of them. Can you train them? Can you give them marketing supporting materials? What can you do? Can you give them cheat sheets to know when best to kind of introduce you? Um, all the stuff that's in your head, get it out of your head and get it to your partners. Um, because it's not common sense, it's your experience. And so give the benefit of your experience to your partners. If you've got, if you've really nailed your partner value proposition, where you really want to be with your partners in terms of ongoing clients is you want to be built into their processes. You want to work with your partners on what their own customer journey is and go, when's the best time for me to be inserted in here? And if your value proposition is right, your partners will be more than happy to do that because they want to get you in front of their partner because you, ha you help them deliver a better result. The other side of it is customer facing. Look, nice little word soup there. Could probably add 20 more in. Um, all the ways that you would promote yourself directly are all ways that your partner could as well. Two things I want to particularly mention on this. The first one is um, there should be a match in tone anyway, because if your part, your ideal partner should have similar ways of communicating and similar values and everything else to you. So your tone of voice shouldn't need to change too much. But how you top and tail materials or things absolutely should. Some of the partners we used to work for, the, the head of their marketing department probably earned more than my business turned over in a year, right? And yet we'd be sending out maybe an email a week for, for them. So we were promoting other people's products, other people's customers, and yet every email came through written like they were sending it direct out to their list. So either me or someone in my team had to amend it and then send it back to them for approval. And then the same thing would happen every week. Now we stuck with said partner because they were a five figure a month partner to us. So it was, it was kind of, you put up with that stuff, right? But we wouldn't if it was someone else. If you want someone to do what they're going to do, if you want someone to do what you want them to do, when you want them to do it, make it easy. So tweak your materials so that your partners can cut and paste and ask them about what works for them. Maybe they've got a really successful blog. Maybe they're on brilliant webinars. Maybe it's all about live events. What can you do to get in front of your, your partner's audience? Because again, if your value proposition is right, they will want to do this. Um, and if your work become, essentially you want to become the marketing manager's best friend, right? Um, because it's not cheeky getting more and more of your content out there. Essentially you're helping them. It's one less blog post that they've got to write themselves. It's one less social post, it's one less speaker to find, right? If your value proposition is right, they'll want to put you in front of their audience. Okay, so with all that in mind, it's time to go out there and find some partners, right? One thing I will quickly say is be easy on yourself. Um, if you're just starting out on your partnership journey, your ideal partner is not the one in two years that you want in two years time that's going to change your business. Because A, it's going to take you ages to get that massive partner and they might break you, right? If they start chucking loads of leads at you. Your first partners, you want to be people who are maybe going to be slightly more forgiving. You can test and measure with a little bit more and build up from there. To do that, no, number one, remember your partner value proposition. You should never have to pitch. It's like hard sell a partnership opportunity, right? You might have to lead the conversation if you're the one going out and they're doing it, but it should feel like an opportunity. They should be getting as excited about this as you are. If they're not, you've either got your value proposition slightly wrong, or sometimes people just don't get it. And that, that does happen, they kind of move on. Um, but it shouldn't, you shouldn't ever feel like you're having to sell to someone to want to work with you. Um, and the second thing is use your network. So coming right back to that slide on referrals and partnerships, for most of us, we will have um, a bunch of our ideal partners either directly in our network or once removed from there. And looking for introduction to potential partners, such an easy thing to do. Asking for introductions to full stop is a thing that obviously I help people with. But where, there, where it's a direct client one, some people can still be slightly hesitant about it because they know there's a sell involved. 
if you're looking for introductions to partners, if you've got your value proposition right, literally you're looking for introductions for a joint opportunity. There's no sell involved, which means people will be like, people will just, yeah, of course. It just makes complete sense as long as you've got that value prop right. And when you get those referrals, that's where the trust comes in. And so you get those conversations. As you build your partner channels, your social proof becomes your partners, not the referral, which means you're able to go colder and colder as you grow. But the vast majority of us, the introduction piece is a really, really strong one to work with. Final note is on materials. Um, if you're kind of producing partner materials to send out to people, I'm going to come back to them. Remember your partner value proposition. So many people I know send out either their standard company brochure or they um, they just change a couple of change a couple of slides at the, at the start and the end. And so it talks a lot about them and what they can do for the client. Any partner marketing material should be essentially all about the partner and how you help them and how you make it easy for them. So. I have a really strong partner value proposition. Get your systems and partnership structure right. Build relationships with your partners, help them to connect you to their audience and then use what's in your network to go out there and engage with partners. Put all that together and you'll be well away. Right. Hopefully that was a value very quickly how I can help you do this stuff. And um, look, I work, I do tailored stuff directly with you and your business. Typically, that's up to a six month engagement, normally three or four months, quite content heavy um, and then hang around to make sure that you actually implement and get this stuff done. Um, owner managed businesses, I run a couple of group programs um, as well. Um, first one being the Kick-Ass Collaboration Program, which essentially is going through what we've just gone through um, in a group coaching format, um, but we actually get stuff done. So it's two half day sessions a month um, where we actually do stuff. We get 80% of the work done in the sessions. And there's a maximum of eight people on any one uh, program to keep it super personal. It's 400 quid a month. Next one kicks off on the 6th of June. The last cohort, um, yeah, they've all more than covered that back already kind of thing. It's only just finished. They're all having partner conversations, getting leads, um, testimonials I can, I can share with you there. Um, if referrals are more your thing and you're like, you know what, I'm not quite ready for partnerships, then I'm a referral program. Um, which again is based on a framework that's two half day uh, online workshops a one-to-one -one with me three hour on group follow-up sessions digital support throughout next cohort starts may the 7th that's a one-off 600 quid that one so if you'd like any um i'll send information out on the follow-up email but if you if you're interested specifically knows if you drop a yes into the chat or whatever then i'll know to pick that up with you afterwards and give you a call um so that's it for me um thank you for listening uh, the floor is yours. There's 18 minutes for any questions you've got. Raise a hand, just shout. I'll quickly check the chat. Uh, yes, Jules. If you're in a market at the moment where you know that you're probably the higher end of what you're providing as a service, so for me it's events in the medical industry, medical, yeah. sorry, for events, Um how can you add on that kind of extra bit for partnerships if you already know that your quotes potentially will get rejected for the fact that you're a high-end services provider? When events are already struggling, like we've gone through COVID, we've gone through everything. I know exactly what I can provide as a company, but a lot of event organisers are wanting to cut corners. Like today, I've had two emails saying, Oh no, our budget's smaller than that. What can you do? Not much. <laughs> yeah, so that comes into your partner targeting. I'd say, Jules, you look to target with event organizers who are only working with the niche of people where they where that, that piece isn't going to be as much of an, an issue. Uh, because actually partnerships can be a great way for securing or even increasing your pricing depending where you are, because you work with the right partners who are already in that market. Right. So that so that absolutely comes into your partner targeting. And that's where just going when you're doing your partner targeting, let's say it's accountants or event organizers in your in your instance, you need to be more specific than event organizers as of, of what size you're targeting, which sectors, and you just get specific around that, Jules. Okay, um, cool. Thank you. And I should have woven you into my bad festival experience piece. So um uh, hindsight, <laughs> there we go. Never mind. 
Um, oh, I've got one on the chat. Um, direct message. Can you please summarize the five points? So just to go over these again. Discovery. Have a really strong partner value proposition that's all about the partner. Who do you help make look amazing in terms of delivering their end result? The next bit is systems and structure. So have the right structure in terms of commissions and then make sure you've got systems to track leads that have come in. Nurturing is all around building personal relationships, but also doing the transactional relationships right as well. So set expectations, have onboarding processes, all that wonderful stuff. Connection is about giving your partners the tools to be able to promote you. And that's either training them personally to be able to personally recommend you as clients come through or helping them proactively put you in front of their the rest of their audience and list with kind of customer facing materials. And then E is engagement. What's your strategy for going out there and getting partners? And it should be hooked around leveraging your networks. Um, any more for any more on any of those specific points? Just yes, one, Alex. Just one, I was just wondering, would you talk about this on your website? Would it be something you'd say that we're open to being your partner or do you keep that as a more of a you know, one-to-one -one conversation? There is absolutely no harm in having it on your website. Um, that there's three bits of partner marketing material that I recommend. Um, and that, and I say the most useful one is a partner deck or a partner brochure, depending on, depending on who your audience is, depending on maybe you have like kind of modern deck format or brochure format really. But that is great. That's great. That's the first one I would do because unless you're a huge organization, people probably aren't visiting your website proactively looking to partner with you. Your partner conversations are going to come from another sort of interaction. So the great thing about a deck is it's something you can send to someone and it outlines it essentially outlines all the stuff in that dance framework, right? It highlights the problems of the partner, what you solve, all this stuff. That's great because once you've had an initial chat with someone before you go, right, let's have a proper conversation. You can send them that and it just shows it just shows that you've thought about this stuff and it's there's a perception piece, right? It elevates you above other people in the market. The other two are either more like flyers that are kind of a bit more promo -y stuff or having a web page and the web page is very essentially it's like the deck you can just do more with it right you can have video testimonials on there from existing partners all that sort of stuff so uh so yes is the short answer alex i don't think there's any harm in having it there um but it's still probably going to be something you use as a signpost rather than yeah yeah, yeah. Like until until you're kind of out there and then and, and everything else so cool any more for any more No. Okay. Awesome. Right. Well, thank you all for coming along. Um, as I said, I will, um, I will get the, I'll get the slides and the recording and some info, um, back to you this afternoon, actually, um, have a wonderful end to the week. Um, and thank you all. And finally, if this has been useful and there's other people that you think would find it of use, then I would love for you to share the link to the next one with them. And I'll include that in the email as well. So there we go. I couldn't do something on word of mouth and not ask you to um, help share, could I? So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Cheers.